Funding for this program is made possible by Burke Nursery and Garden Center in Burke, Virginia. You'll find trees and shrubs, perennials and annuals, water garden supplies, house plants, and bird and gardening supplies. Burke Nursery also provides landscape, plant diagnostic, and installation services, as well as the October month-long Pumpkin Playground Festival featuring hayrides and much more. For more information, you can check out their website or call 703-323-1188. Welcome to Gardening with Burke Nursery, the show where we help you grow your garden and increase the curb appeal of your yard. I'm your host, Misty Kacheris, the horticulturalist at Burke Nursery and Garden Center. You know, fall is a mystical time. It's when the carbohydrates in the soil are working their magic to interact with the roots of the plants and increase the roots' vitality. It's also when the temperatures are cooler so you feel more comfortable spending time in the garden. And it's the time when you want to give the soil in your gardens all the help you can to make certain that when you plant next spring, you have fertile gardens for your plants to grow. So I'd like to invite you to join me as I share my steps in how to improve the soil conditions of your gardens. Well, the first thing that we always have to start with are those weeds. And the weeds are just horrendous this year. And part of the reason that they're so bad is that we had a warm winter. Then after the warm winter, we had a lot of rain. And then after the lot of rain, it came at night, which made it even worse. And all of that, increase the strength of your weeds to grow. I have received so many complaints about this from, from my customers that come in and talk to me about Burke Nursery, at Burke Nursery, and what do you do with the weeds? Well, the first thing that I always talk to them is about what I call the mechanical approach. And the mechanical approach is where you actually go out in your garden and you use a hoe or you use maybe a little shovel, you use your hands, and you literally hand pull the weeds. So here I have a picture of my garden. And in my garden, I hand pulled all the weeds and all the weeds were gone. Well, this is a picture of after I hand pulled the weeds. And as you can see, I have some weeds that have come back. So now I am going to have to resort to some different approaches. And the other is what I call the chemical approach or the non-select approach. This means spraying your weeds. And you need to be very careful if you're going to use a non-select approach because non-select means that these killers don't select where they're going to, um, what plants they're going to kill. And if you get them on the wrong plant, the definition of a weed is a plant in the wrong place. So be very careful. There's your glyphosate, which is the traditional, it comes in different, different companies now make it. This is tryptochlor. Both of these are tryptochlor. And these are your heavier duty ones. So I don't really recommend that you use these in your flower garden because these could travel to the roots. Now here's a new product that is made with, um, and I'm, uh, caprylic acid. And this one is organic. Now organic doesn't mean that it's not a non-select. It is non-select, so it will take out everything that it touches. But what I like about this product is that it also stays within the roots of the plant. So you have a less likelihood of what I call transference. And then your milder form of glyphosate also, you're less likely of transference. What is transference? Well, that's when you spray the plant and it goes into the roots, but it may also go and leach a little too much into the soil that a plant with roots a little too close may also suffer. So you need to be a little cautious. But that's the first thing, is taking a look at how 
are you going to remove your weeds and keep them removed? So the next step is what I call amending the soil. Now, some of you out there that have also worked with your soils may say, wait a minute, we've just gotten rid of all the weeds. Don't we want to put down something that will prevent weeds from coming? And that's called a pre-emergent. I will talk about pre-emergence later in the show, but in actuality, before you put in a pre-emergent, you really want to amend the soil. So what is amending the soil? Well, amending the soil is where you add either some form of compost to the soil. And you can see through the picture that I have here of some of the composts that are available. Now, the compost that you want depends on what you're growing. So there's the leaf humus, and there is manure, and the manure can be cow manure or it can be chicken manure. Be very cautious, though, if you decide to use manure. Do the best you can to try to buy manure from a reputable source. You don't want manure that has not been homogenized or processed properly. As a matter of fact, one year I had a person bring in a soil sample, and I don't usually do soil sample analysis, except that this analysis was very easy. Her question to me was, is it safe to plant her vegetables in this soil? And all I could see were maggots in the soil. The answer was no. She had used unpasteurized, untreated horse manure. And that horse manure led to all the maggots, and she literally could not plant any vegetables in that garden. So that's why when it comes to manure as a soil amendment, be very careful. Mushroom compost is one of my favorite soil amendments. And that is my favorite because it's one of the best soil amendments to use if you're renovating your lawn. And it's one of the best soil amendments to use for vegetable gardens. And then of course, there's soil conditioner, there's gypsum. Now gypsum is a soil conditioner that doesn't change the pH. All it does is break up the clay. And then, of course, there's always your own compost, which is a phenomenal soil amendment. So if you have questions about what soil amendment would be the best in your yard or your garden, feel free to email me at misty at burknursery.com. Now, a question that I do get very frequently when I talk about soil amendments is, if I use a soil amendment, do I also need to use a fertilizer in my garden? And the answer is yes. The reason is there's a difference between fertilizer and soil amendments. Soil amendments, their purpose is to improve the quality of your soil. That means the soil is able to percolate better. What is percolate? Well, it drains better. It's not hard. It has more air particles. And soil, like all living entities, whether you're human, animal, or plant-based, or earth-based, needs the oxygen molecules to help it enrich and to give it more flexibility and more drainage. The other thing that a soil amendment does, it enables the soil to take on nutrients. So it increases that soil's abilities to take the nutrients that you give it and utilize it and put it back into the roots of your plant. Now, what are the nutrients? Ah, the nutrients, that's your fertilizer. And there are so many different types of fertilizer. I grew up in New England. And so we loved our fish emulsion fertilizer. It, yes, it definitely has the fish smell. So if you have a problem with that, you may not want to use that. But fish emulsion is one fertilizer. Your plant starter is another. And there are two types of fertilizer. There are what I call the generic fertilizer. And then there are what I call specialty fertilizers. And what's the difference? 
Well, your generic fertilizers are just fertilizer, and that's it. And if you look at this bag, you'll see three numbers. And the first number is your nitrogen. And the nitrogen goes towards the leaves and towards the fruit of the plant. So that goes above the surface. The next number is your phosphorus. That goes to increasing the root strength and enabling that plant and its roots to grab a hold via the use of carbohydrates, the nutrients that are in the soil. So that's below. And then the last number is potash. A potash depends on what part of the country how you want to pronounce it either is correct and that's potassium so that um, that is for the general overall health and what we like to do especially when we're teaching the young ones uh, gardening and fertilizer is up down and around and that means up your nitrogen down your phosphorus and all around your potassium, your potash. Then the specialty fertilizers, they have in them, and for the specialty fertilizers, this is where you need to read the bag on the side. Because on the side, it gives you the nitrogen makeup, it gives you the uh, phosphorus, phosphates, and it gives you the potash, but it also has all these other things listed. And so what it lists is it lists what I call the micronutrients. And the micronutrients are sulfur, calcium, magnesium, and the amount of sulfur depends on whether you are planning on fertilizing a acid-loving plant or a neutral plant. Or it also represents, are you planning on fertilizing vegetables? Or are you planning on fertilizing trees or shrubs? So again, if you don't know, first of all, if you don't know what type of fertilizer to use, then my recommendation is you go for either the 5105 or you go for the 101010, your generic neutral fertilizers, these work with every product. And the reason I'm stressing the numbers is it doesn't matter what brand the fertilizer is, it's the numbers that you want to look at. You want the numbers in a general fertilizer to be all even, or you want that middle number to be higher. And then you also have, especially if you're starting to plant for the first time, then this fertilizer is a 3103 fertilizer. And a 3103, that means that for new plants, they need to have good root development. And that's why that middle number, the phosphorus, has to be so high. And I always recommend that if you're going to plant a new plant, it is good to put in, if not, if you don't have this starter fertilizer, then a 5105. You just want to make sure they use fertilizer with that middle number being higher for anything that you plant new. So again, if you're not sure what would be the best fertilizer for your situation, feel free to email me. And again, my email is misty at BurkeNursery.com. So now we've put down, or we've pulled out the weeds and killed the weeds, and hopefully they haven't grown within the 24 hours that we're doing everything else, which is the soil amendment, and then adding the fertilizer. And now is where you want to put down your pre-emergent. And what is a pre-emergent? Well, there's a couple of different kinds of pre-emergence. Let me just move these 
over. One pre-emergent is the old traditional pre-emergent. This is what is known as landscape cloth. And so it's a very thin cloth, and you probably can't see it in this light, but it is porous so that the water and the nutrients can get through there. Eventually, this needs to be replaced about five years, usually, is the shelf life, as I like to call it, of a landscape fabric. If you put this down, then you need to make sure that, actually, this is the one pre-emergent, <laughs> sorry about this, this is one pre-emergent you actually do want to put down, well, you back and forth, back and forth. You can either put this down before the soil amendments or you can put it down after, doesn't matter, whichever you prefer. And then the other one that I like is I like the newspaper. And the reason I like newspaper as a pre-emergent is that newspaper will break down and newspaper will make for a better soil in general. And newsprint and new is now uses soy-based ink, so that's safe for your garden, and it attracts worms. And it's a great way to get rid of weeds without using any chemicals at all. And then you do have your other pre-emergents, which are chemical-based. What these do, these work by mutating the seeds. Yes, so when all those weeds start putting out seeds, then these mutate the seeds and don't let the seeds grow. The good news is that these do not interfere with any plants that are already in your garden. So you don't have to worry. They're not a kill. They won't injure any of your plants. The bad news is, because they won't injure any your plants, what it also means is if you have weeds in the garden that you haven't pulled, these aren't going to kill the weeds. So it, as a pre-emergent, it prevents the weeds from growing. So one question I do get when I talk about using either landscape fabric or perhaps even using newspaper is, can I use plastic as a way of getting rid of the weeds? And yes, it always does boil down to the weeds in our gardens doesn't it, when we're looking at how to make better soil and how to grow. But I do not recommend using plastic in your garden. The main reason is that plastic, especially in the summer months, can get very, very warm, can get very hot. And what can happen is even though, whether you use the landscape fabric or whether you use plastic, and you're going to be cutting a hole to put your plant in. But the problem is that as your plant grows and as the roots grow, they're going to grow under that plastic. And then that plastic can possibly make it too warm for the roots. And in the long run, it can stress out your plant. So unless you have no option and you positively have to use plastic, my recommendation is if you want to use a weed barrier and you don't want it to decompose within two to three months, your newspaper will decompose within two to three months, then go with the landscape fabric. That is your best bet. And then finally, the, what really also helps the soil is mulch. And what one of the things that I talk about is the reason mulch is so important, it's another aspect of cutting down weeds. In other words, you get less weeds when you mulch. It maintains the soil temperature. So what that means is when it gets colder in the winter months, it helps give a little warmy blanket, so to speak, to your roots. In the summer months, when it gets too hot, then it can assured that those roots are less heated up. The other thing, and this is especially 
important in the winter months. We lose a lot of nutrition in our soil in the winter months if there's no mulch. And what happens is that you have the snow sometimes, or you have heavy rains, or you have ice, and that gets into the soil and it starts creating havoc with the soil and you get your frost heaves and you get your cracking. And with the mulch, because it evens the temperature, that doesn't happen. So that is something that's very important. The other is that mulch can actually protect your plants from fungal disease. So I have a picture here of a uh, plant from my garden, from my vegetable garden, that the leaves have what we call powdery mildew. And being a vegetable garden, I'm torn it all out. But the problem is some of those spores from that fungus are actually in the soil. And so I need to put some mulch over that. In a vegetable garden, another mulch that's very good to use actually is straw, which is another form of mulch. And so what happens is that spores, they go from, they travel because of the rain, they travel because of the wind. And so if you have clean mulch over that area, when you have rain, you're not going to be able to get to the spores and the spores won't come back up to the surface to hit the leaves. So that's another good reason to have mulch. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you some of the mulch that I have here. And I have these in little plastic bags because it's a lot easier and a lot lighter than it is to bring in all those mulch bags. And the first bag of mulch that I'd like to talk about is what I call our generic mulch. And that generic mulch is the hardwood shredded mulch. And hardwood shredded mulch is just what it says. It's mulch that comes from hardwood, which is basically your oak, your maple. It is a wonderful mulch. Its pH is a little more on the uh, alkaline side than because of, of the maple and the hardwood than some of the other mulches that I'll show you. But if you don't know what type of mulch to get, then I recommend the hardwood shredded mulch. And the other important rule of thumb with mulches is never mulch more than two inches. Well, there is one exception, and so I'll take a, an aside very shortly to tell you the exception. But the, but the general rule is to mulch only two inches and also keep the mulch two inches away from your foundation and keep the mulch two to four inches away from any stems or trunks of the trees. And the exception is that when I plant my garlic bulbs in the winter months, I actually will put down four inches of, of mulch over my garlic bulbs. Or if you may have a uh, calla lily that you want to see if it'll survive through the winter months, put eight inches of mulch over that calla lily. The next one is your shredded pine. And your shredded pine comes, just like it says, from pine trees. And this is acidic. So it's a little more stuffier, so to speak. Not quite as, as um, flexible as the shredded, but it still will decompose fairly nicely. And other people like mulch that is larger. And so you have something like your Rappahannock mulch. It's a pine mulch. It's a chunk. And I like the looks of the chunk, but it won't work on a hill because that just rolls away. And another one that I like the looks of in a flat garden is what we call your silver dollar mulch. Look at the difference in the size of that. This is your Rappahannock, and this is your silver dollar mulch. 
So the silver dollar is twice the size. But again, if you're on a hill, that can create a problem. So if you have a hill and you want a mulch that is not going to be a problem for you as far as rolling away too quickly, this is what we call cypress mulch. Kind of looks like your pine mulch over here. And cypress mulch, when it gets wet, which is why some people don't like it, actually gets a bright, usually a pretty bright orange color. If you have a dog run, or if you have kids that are playing in the yard, a good mulch to have is your cedar chips. That makes a wonderful mulch for a playground. And it makes a wonderful mulch for a dog run. The question I also have is that people say, well, this hardwood shredded or shredded pine mulch, that might, uh, that might bring uh, problems with termites. No, it won't. Now, there's another cedar mulch. I do not recommend the shredded cedar mulch for a dog run or for a playground. But this, both these cedar mulches, they actually are wonderful if you are worried about termites. And what I started saying is that you will not get termites. Termites aren't attracted to the hardwood shredded mulch. If you put down this mulch and suddenly you get termites, it's because you already had the termites there under the surface and they're now coming to the surface because of the mulch. But, or rather not because of the mulch, but basically with the mulch there. Your cedar, if you have anthills, your cedar chips or shredded cedar mulch is wonderful because it will kill the anthills. And so basically there's a mulch for every purpose. And again, if you don't know which mulch it is, please feel free to email me at misty at brooknursery.com and I'll be happy to help you with the mulch. I'm so glad that you were able to join me today and I hope that you enjoyed learning about improving the soil conditions of your garden. I'm your host, Misty Kacharis, and I'd like to thank you for spending your time with me here at Gardening with Burke Nursery. I'm looking forward to seeing you grow your garden. Funding for this program is made possible by Burke Nursery and Garden Center in Burke, Virginia. You'll find trees and shrubs, perennials and annuals, water garden supplies, house plants, and bird and gardening supplies. Burke Nursery also provides landscape, plant diagnostic, and installation services, as well as the October month-long Pumpkin Playground Festival featuring hayrides and much more. For more information, you can check out their website or call 703-323-1188.